All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, we're going to start out on 183. 183 tonight. Good song to get started here. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. 183. Kids, everyone got a book? Great. All right, on the first. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. On the second, it tells me of a Savior's love, who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved. And the last one tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe. Who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. <clears throat> oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because <clears throat> Amen. I love that song. Because he first loved me, I love him. Wonderful singing. 175. Let's try this one. 175, it's just like his great love. <clears throat> okay, I think we know this. We heard it. Okay, let's try it on the first. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true, and never fails howe'er it is tried, no matter what I do. I've sinned against this love of His, but when I knelt to pray, confessing all my guilt to Him, the sin cloud rolled away. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great. Okay, we got it. The second, sometimes the clouds of trouble leave him the sky above. I cannot see my Savior's face. I doubt his wondrous love. But he from heaven's mercy seat, beholding my day <laughs> in pit. He bursts the clouds between and shows me he is there. It's just like Jesus to hold the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Let's try the last. Oh, I could sing forever. Of Jesus' love divine, of all his care and tenderness for this poor life of mine. His love is in and over all, and wind and waves away. When Jesus whispers, peace be still, and rolls the clouds away. All right. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Well, we're going to get that one day. <laughs> hey, that was good. That makes you want to do one of those kind of... Okay, maybe not. Didn't it, kids? Nobody? Kids? All right. That was a good song. That'll be stuck in my head this week. Good. All right. Well, again, thank you for coming this evening. And uh, look forward to a few things here again this coming up. Can you believe we're already coming down to the wire? July? Man, 
it's flown by, hasn't it? And uh, I hope that you've uh, had a good summer, I guess you could say, thus far. And Lord willing, we'll see uh, coming out strong there. And then we're coming down to the wire with our starting our Bible Institute in the fall. And I think we figured out it's starting all, sometime August uh, 15th or so, I think it was, uh, somewhere around that week. So uh, getting ready for that, excited about that. And uh, again, invite, if people want to come and just sit and listen or audit the class, they're more than welcome to do that. And uh, so we'll be looking forward to some of those things. Moving into, I believe, Exodus and then into some of the other uh, books of the New Testament as well, obviously. And so pray about that, if you will. Uh, we'll see some fruit from that. Uh, let's see here, praying about, uh, please continue to pray for our VBS coming up, and Lord willing, we'll get to see many children attend that and obviously reach them, and uh, reach them, first of all, with the gospel, but uh, encourage them, especially. I'm so thankful for our children the Lord has blessed us with. I'm talking about all of them in the church. Boy, we have a good group and really appreciate uh, their faithfulness and their help, and, and boy, we go out uh, passing out flyers, man, we just... That one, we went down that one street in the van, and the people just saw this van roll up, and then the doors flung open. Boom! Here comes all these kids. <laughs> they were going, what in the world? And so, but appreciate their faithfulness and helping out so much. All right, let's see here. We got uh, the baptistry, Lord willing, will be coming here in the next couple of weeks. So pray for that, and then once we get that going, we'll get started here. And we, we really need to get that baptistry in first so we can kind of see where it's at, how to angle it, and what the dimen dimensions are on it. And then we can kind of, we're going to flow over with our platform here, and that's going to look real nice and get all of that handled. And so, again, if you'd like to help us with that, we'd appreciate the help there as well. Okay, I don't think anything else. Pray for those tonight. Couldn't make it. We've got several out, a uh, couple out of town, and then others not feeling well this morning. Uh, made mention of a few folks just under the weather. They don't caught something, and so I hope you stay healthy uh, this week. Nobody else feels too bad, do they? Okay, good, feeling pretty good thus far. All righty. And so again, just remind you that uh, uh, we have a few of those things coming up. Lord willing, Wednesday night, uh, hopefully get back here if we can. And I appreciate all of you that have been so faithful to our midweek service, and so I appreciate you there. Okay, enough talking there. Uh, anything else tonight? Anybody think of anything? I appreciate, again, you coming to our prayer time at 5.30. That's really important. I think one, if not the most important time of our church because it's tr we need prayer. You know that, and uh, we've got to seek the Lord. So I thank you so much uh, for coming there. Okay. Anyone have an offering tonight? Just again, just to ask. Okay, thank you. I, again, thank you for being so faithful in that. By, by way of that, again, I know I can tell you folks who are the faithful faithful attenders, but Lord's blessed us so much. And uh, again, as I said this, I know I sound like a broken record, but yeah, we're able to pay our bills every month, and we haven't been late on any of them yet, praise the Lord. And so thank God for that. Uh, but it is because of your faithfulness, every one of you faithfully giving, and some of you sacrificially giving, and so appreciate you and being obedient to that. And because of that, we can be here. Just heard the AC kick on. Praise God for that. Amen. <laughs> If you remember the old building or the one we were in, there was no AC vent overhead the pulpit. And I just I was sweating. I sweat anyways, you know, up here. But I was sweating. And you all are just sitting back there. Ah, it was nice and cool. And then we got in the office space, remember, and it was almost the same thing. And it was like, oh. No, I did have one over me, didn't I? I had, a, had one right over me. But this one's even better. I've got two, three, three, right? Man, it's just perfect. Anyways, Lord's blessing us so much. Okay. All righty then. Well, let's, uh, I forgot to pray. Can we have a word of prayer real quick and then we'll head, move on. Lord, thank you for this opportunity tonight. And again, truly thankful for all that you've done. As uh, Lord mentioned before, but Lord, we know that not everybody is as blessed as we are. Not every church is as blessed as we are. And God, we thank you for your immense and wonderful hand upon us. We do pray and ask that you'd guide us this evening. Thank you again for your great grace. In Jesus' precious holy name, and amen. All right. Well, would you take, let's sing our last hymn here, number 179. Okay, this is a song, a newer song we haven't sung, 179. Okay, so if we don't know it, just listen to it and hum along, 179. We're learning some of these songs. Okay, that sounds familiar. Okay, 179, let's try it. 
that God should love a sinner such as I should yearn to change my sorrow into bliss, nor rest till he had planned to bring me nigh. How wonderful he such love, such one love, such love, such wondrous love, that God should love a sinner such as I. How full is love like? Okay, that's pretty good. On the second, that Christ should join so freely in the scheme, although it meant his death only if ever. <clears throat> Then love the one me. Okay. Such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love, then God should love a sinner such as I. Wonderful love like this. On the last one. And now he take me to the sun. He asked me not to serve place. So, done, wondering how well I'm done, why so great love, such love, such wondrous love, such love, such wondrous love, that God should love a sinner such as I. Oh, you were doing so good, too. Okay, we weren't doing too good, but you did good. Hey, we learned a new one. Such love, such wondrous. Okay, good. That was a good one. Uh, some folks probably watching us online going, but well, we know that song. I'm messing it all up for them. I'm glad to sing those songs, though. And the good old songs. Some of those, if you look in your hymnals, read some of those. Man, they were written back in 18-something, others in the 20s and in the teens and everything else. Boy, I like those songs, but... All right, kids, are you heading out tonight? Okay, they're heading out. We're going to be tonight. Thank you for bringing your Bible here. And uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. <coughs> Get that out of the way. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. All right. And, uh, and the month of July, again, going through on Sunday evenings, looking at uh, the tremendous comfort we find in the temptations that come our way. The temptations that come our way. Now, last week, we looked a little bit about our enemy and how he wants to defeat us and discourage us and get us out of whack, if you will, and uh, get us off track. Now, again, 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. And uh, uh, let me see. I was going to read a different portion. No, let's go to verse number 10, if you don't mind there. Number 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Notice verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Uh, we see, first of all, and I wanted to just start there, that we find that often we can fail in our... Uh, dealing with temptations and trials and other things. We, we can fail in that, nothing wrong with it. We're human beings. We still are here on this earth in what we call the fallen state. And that day, glorious day is coming when we will no longer be here. But while we're here, we have to deal with these things. And one of the areas and reasons, I should say, that we can fail and we cannot truly implement that comfort in the temptation is because of an ignorance of his devices. Now, notice that. This is what we call often the method of operation of our adversary, the, the MO. You know, what's your MO? You ever heard that? Uh, what's your MO? What, what's your method of operation? What do you, why do you do what you do? Uh, how do you do what you do? Now, again, this is something we started a little bit last week looking at, but thinking about this, I think a lot of people fail to take the comfort that's in the temptation or during the temptation because we are ignorant of him, of our adversary. We also will see that we're often failed or we do fail in that because of the ignorance of our own flesh. If you're like me, failing in that. Not aware of my own flesh, of what I'm capable of doing outside of the hand of God. Now, this again, 
are the devices at the adversary's disposal. These are the three things that are in this world. 1 John 2, 16 says, For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, he says, but it's of the world. Those things we have to deal with. Now, he tried this first and foremost all the way back in the Garden of Eden. He tried it with Eve, didn't he? Genesis chapter 3, he talks about that. He tries that, lust of the flesh. He said, do you not see this? Doesn't it look good? She said, well, it does look good to the eyes, doesn't it? Looks good. He says, doesn't it, well, wouldn't it be nice to eat that, the lust of the flesh, right? Be good, be good. We know that. Uh, the pride of life, he says, you know that in the day you eat thereof, God knows that you'll become as gods. What's that? And that's pride, right? Lift it up, lift it up. He tried this with them. He tried, them, uh, he tried it with the Lord in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4. Doesn't he do that? Turn these stones, what, into bread. Uh, uh, go up on the pinnacle there and throw yourself off for the, what, uh, the Bible says the angels will take you up. And all of the things he tried to push on our Lord and Savior. He uses them today on the believer, now I'm talking about, to choke the word and make us unfruitful. Okay? Now this is what happens. He wants to choke the word in our lives and cause us as children of God to become unfruitful. We looked in uh, Sunday morning at uh, Galatians chapter 5, and we'll get to that, Lord willing, next week as we wrap up that chapter as he begins to move into the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't he? And he talks about that fruit that should be produced in the life of a believer. The average Christian today is unfruitful. They're unfruitful. The average Christian today is all talk. The average pastor today is all talk. No action, no fruit. Where's the fruit at? Now, think about that. He wants to get us out of whack, if you will, off course, derail us, the cares of this world he talks about. Nothing wrong. We have to do deal with the home. We have to deal with marriage. We have to deal with children. We have to deal with education, our job, our business, all the things. But if we're not careful, we know we can become unfruitful. We, again, must be very careful. We must be cast upon the Lord, as he talks about in First Peter. We also see the deceitfulness of riches, that can come into us. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19, A feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Ain't that true? Boy, you can wave a $50 bill, and you could be the rudest person to somebody. Hey, get over here. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I'm coming. I'm coming. What, what, what did you need? Not always. I'm being very silly, but you understand, money answereth all things, doesn't it? Oh, what people will do for money, and I'll keep it clean tonight, but what people will do for money amazes me. What I'll do for money, boy, there's some things there to talk about. He says, notice, <clears throat> we'll get an education to make the money, uh, <clears throat> put the whole family to work to make money, we we'll get money to get happiness, not so, we you know. Pleasures of life, he talks about. We live in a pleasure crazy world. 2 Timothy 3 talks about that. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We need some pleasure out of this world. We know that. We must not allow it to choke the word. Okay, so just we've already talked about some of those things, but we see very clearly that if we are ignorant of his method of operation, I said he's very deceitful, isn't he? Very subtle. You don't see it coming. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's this major problem in your relationship. There's a major problem in your home. Where'd that come from? Came out of left field somewhere. Just crazy, isn't it? And we're not careful, excuse me. We see his method of operation. He's very deceitful. He's very hard. Again, he has the unbelievers in the palm of his hand. <clears throat> excuse me. And he wants us as well. Now, secondly, notice a compromise with the world. Here's another area that we can fail to not acknowledge the temptation in our lives. What happens? The comfort. The comfort is there if we'll take it, but often we don't. We can compromise with the world. That'll take us out. Why do we fail? <clears throat> now, let's go back because I want you to see this. All the way back to Exodus and chapter 8, if you don't mind. Exodus chapter 8, because this is a tactic used since the beginning of time. Compromise with the world. Exodus chapter 8. Oh, let's go down somewhere around verse 
Oh, verse 25. There it is. Verse 25. Verse 25. Now, note with me, it says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron. Now, again, remember, they wanted to go out, as according to the word of God, to worship the Lord. And um, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not me to do so. He says, It's not right. It's not according to God's plan. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as He uh, shall command us. As He shall command us. Now, notice the first thing. Pharaoh says, why don't you stay in the world and worship God? Now, that sounds pretty good. Let's stay in the world and worship God. Now, we have to be in the world. You know that. Uh, we have to be in this world. But as soon as that water gets inside of the boat, we start to sink. As soon as the world gets inside of us, we start to sink. Now, notice the first offer. This is the position of some churches today. We'll stay in the world to reach the world. Act like the world to reach the world. Some Christians. Be like the world to re win the world, which is not biblical. Now, notice here. This is the abomination to the world. I like how this is put. He says there's an abomination. If we sacrifice certain animals, the Egyptians see that as an abomination. How does it play out for us? Well, this is an abomination to the world. We must be very careful. You try and stay in the world and sacrifice and give and serve and worship God, you become an abomination to the world. They want nothing to do with you. Now think about that. Now, what's his second offer? He offered four compromises to Israel. This is what they do today. Secondly, he says, stay close to the world and worship God. Okay, you're not going to stay in it. Stay close to it. Now, notice verse 28. As Pharaoh said, I will let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only, notice this, ye shall not go very far and treat for me. You shall not go very far. Don't go very far. And again, the world will not let you go and does not want to let you go. This is a sure way to get you back into the world, isn't it? They just, just stay close to it. Stay close. One of the key elements in people dealing with addiction is to cut it off. I mean, they don't, that's what the Bible says. Don't make provisions for the flesh. You don't Okay, I'm not going to do that anymore, but I'm going to just, in case I want to go back to it, it's over there. You know, They tell you to get rid of it. <clears throat> now, as best you can. It's not easy to just drop it cold turkey, whatever the addiction is. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I heard one fantastic example. David slung the stone, hit him in the forehead. People said, oh, he's dead. That's good enough. David said, I'm not waiting around to find out if I knocked him out or if he's dead. I don't know. So what am I going to I'm going to go over there, and I'm going to cut his head off. That's a little gruesome. But that's what David did, didn't he? He wanted to make sure of it. And you think about that. You know, the world says, why don't you just stay close to the world? Worship God. But what's the problem with that? It's a sure way to get you back into the world. This is certain to bring failure in your Christian life. More people fail in their Christian walk. Why? Because they are still associated with, still a part of that. We're to be a peculiar people, set apart, an aspect of our sanctification, a vessel under use. Now, note the third compromise. The third one. Jump over to chapter 10 with me. Chapter 10 and verse 8. Chapter 10 and verse 8, he says, And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. And he said unto them, Go serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? <laughs> Moses said, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons, with our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we will go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, let the Lord be so with you as I will let you go, and your little ones look to it, for evil is before you. Not so, go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. Notice that. He says, can we take it? No, just the men. Just the men go. The third compromise, leave your family in the world and worship God. Isn't it a sad thing that sometimes we leave our family behind? Oh, 
That's a hard thing. Sometimes it's so easy to do that. As long as I'm right with God, as long as I'm serving the Lord, as long as this and that, and we leave our wife and kids behind. We leave them behind. And that's exactly what they want us to do. I'm talking about tonight, understanding the temptations that come our way and that we have a real adversary, that his method of operation is very evil and is very deceptive. And also we have an opportunity to compromise with the world if we're not careful, which will cause us to fail. We compromise with the world and start thinking the world's way and start thinking it's according to its own fashion, its way, its uh, uh, operation of its own. We don't see it God's way. We don't say, thank God I'm going through this. God's just tempt, uh, God doesn't tempt us. God is testing me. Thank God, and I'm going to come out the other side. Now, no, notice number four. He says then in verse 24 there, chapter 10, verse 24, And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said what? Go ye serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed, let your little ones also go with you. Because, okay, so you can take everyone with you. You can take the kids with you, you can take the families with you, but leave your, what? The herds. Leave the possessions. Leave the possessions in the world and worship God. Now, your heart will be where your treasure is. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Your possessions must be given to God. Remember what we read this morning? He said what? Give it to the Lord. You want to save your life? Then lose it. You want to lose your life? Opposite everything else. We've got to understand that. Now notice what he says. Leave your possessions in the world. Why? Because he knew they'd come back for that stuff. And we find that through and through throughout Scripture. Are your possessions with the Lord? Do you leave it with God? The Lord gives, the Lord takes. What? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So be it. Anyways, these compromises that brought to us, are we where we're supposed to be? We don't have to combat, fight with these things. We give it to the Lord. We must understand our relationship with the world. This place is not our home. We must pay, face the spiritual battles and warfare that come our way. As we read this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, come out from among them and I will receive you. I will receive you. Now thinking through this, as I said, I wanted to cut to last week, I didn't get to it, but i getting to it now. We're going to see some examples now of some individuals throughout Scripture that truly lived what we're talking about. They saw the temptation, and they went through it and did a very, very well, very good job. Now, let's go to Genesis uh, chapter 45, if you're still there in Exodus. Go back just a little ways, Genesis 45. Genesis chapter number 45, notice verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with what? Yourselves. That ye sold me hither, talking to his brothers, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Now you know who we're talking about tonight? Joseph. Joseph said, hey, listen, don't be, don't be mad at yourself. Somebody were to do that to us, I don't think that'd be one thing that I would say personally. Hey, be, he's concerned about them. Hey, don't be mad at yourself. Don't be hard on yourself for throwing me in a pit and leaving me to die and, and letting me rot in a prison cell. Don't be mad at yourself. Now, here's the temptation for Joseph. What? Resentment. Bitterness. <clears throat> right? Anger. One of the things that kills most people is that resentment that they bear their hearts. The Bible says, we know later on in Hebrews, it says, now let a root of bitterness spring up, spring up. There's bitterness in our hearts for past transgressions. All of us have them. The roots are there inside of us. The Bible doesn't say root out. We can't do that. They're there. People have hurt you and wounded you in the past. They're there. What's it say? Don't let that root spring up a sprout. And that's what we do. You have control of it. The roots are there, okay, but I've handled it. Lord, help me. They'll start to spring up sometimes, those little sprouts trying to sprout out. What do we do? Lord, help me, Lord. What's it do? Now, here he was tempted with an opportunity to be very resentful and bitter and angry towards people, towards people. But he says, you know what? I'm going to give it to God. And he says, now, don't be grieved. Don't be grieved. Don't be angry. In order to say that, he had to have control over it of his own self, didn't he? In order to tell somebody, don't be grieved, you have to have that control. Uh, don't be angry, you have to have control over your own anger. Oh, and on we could go with that. He says later in chapter 50 and verse 20, 
He says what? God sent me here, not you. God sent me to preserve life, to preserve life. Okay, let's look at another fellow, Daniel. Daniel chapter number six. Can you go there? We're going to turn a few places here, and I thank you for turning in your Bibles. Daniel chapter number six. All right, let's see where we're at here. Daniel 6, verse 10. Daniel 6, verse 10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Notice this, as he did aforetime. As he did aforetime. <clears throat> now again, here's another opportunity. Daniel was given the charge to what? Not pray any longer. And the world came to him and unbelievers came to him and said, you will not serve Christ. You will not do what God told you to do. You will not do that. And Daniel says, I'll go ahead and do it anyways. He was tempted to what? Compromise with the world. And again, this is not just a little slap on the wrist. They were going to what? Throw him in the lion's den. If that was something presented to us, I think we would change our tune a little bit. I know I would. Don't pray. Okay, well, I won't. I'd say, well, I don't, I won't pray, but I'd secretly pray. Daniel said, no, nah, I'm going to swing my doors wide open, the windows open. I'm going to let it known that I'm praying. And Daniel prayed out loud, and he made it known. He has tempted with the opportunity to compromise with unbelievers. And any time an unbeliever comes your way, or so-called spiritual people, and they try and get you to stop doing what you're doing for the Lord, a red flag ought to go up. We got some good people in our lives, maybe some relatives of yours, who are, are supposedly Christian, godly people, but they try and get you to stop doing certain things for the Lord. A red flag, flag ought to go up. Maybe you're going to church a little too much. <laughs> maybe you guys are getting a little too fanatical about that. What are you trying to stop me for? We're tempted with that. And there's the adversary trying to tempt you to see where you are, to see what you're going to do. Now, thinking through this again, there's many characters throughout the Scriptures that have and been tempted with many things, many, many things. Now, we see another uh, character, and you don't have to turn there, but Genesis 12 talks about Abraham. And Abraham ran from a famine, and you know he went into Egypt. And because he went down, he lied, he caused some trouble, and got into some little bit of a mess there. But out came an extra person with him, didn't he? Hagar came out with him. Some people say, well, you know, that was God's plan and other things. And we see here, though, that that became a great burden today. The descendants of Hagar, the descendants of Ishmael, are still a headache, to say it lightly, to the nation of Israel, aren't they? They are at this very moment, if you didn't know, see that, this very moment shooting rockets into Jerusalem. Death upon death, every single day, there's a number of dead, dying Israelis and Palestinians and others. There's a constant war. And what I'm saying here, Abraham was tempted with insecurity. Are you ever tempted with insecurity? I am. Uh, Lord, what do we do now? There's no lie. I don't know what to do. And sometimes we make a mistake, and I know I do, and I know you do. Peter had the same thing. In the garden there, as Jesus came, they came with the arresting party and they with the torches and lamps and everything else and said, we're here to arrest Jesus. <clears throat> now, Peter put his foot in his mouth a lot of the time, but I appreciate Peter because he's the only one that came out swinging. I mean, he was the only one ready to fight. And he drew that sword out and he took a swing at one of the guys. I mean, he was aiming to cut his head off. And the guy had enough sense about him to duck just in time and he lopped his ear off. And Jesus picked that earlobe up off the ground and put it back on his head. There you go, buddy. <laughs> he probably did a little harder than usual. <laughs> and at that moment, I would have said, you're, you're the Lord, okay. But that guy didn't even respond to that. I think about, though, what do you do? I mean, what would you do if they came and arrested Jesus in front of you? What would you do? Some of you may cower and run and hide like most of the apostles did. Some others may fight, may go forward. I don't know. And you get into those heat of those moments, and you don't know what to do, and that's okay. That's okay. We have to be prepared, though. And Peter was not prepared, and Abraham was not prepared. They should have known Jesus repeatedly. 
at least three different times prior to his arrest, Jesus said, they're going to come arrest me. They're going to put me on trial. They're going to find me guilty. They're going to hang me up on a cross. But the third day I'm going to rise again. Did anyone listen? Not one of them. <laughs> not one of them listened. Friends, we must not fail to hear the Word of God. We must not fail to heed the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because when the temptation comes, we're not going to find comfort. We're going to fall to pieces. Everything's falling apart. I don't know what to do. You see these examples, wonderful examples in Scripture. Oh, Abraham failed in this part. He did not wait for the promise of God. Uh, we understand. Now, later we see in Genesis 22, Abraham figured it out, and he got it right with Isaac, didn't he? He got it right. He did what he was supposed to do. He followed through, and God said, I know Abraham will listen and follow me. I can trust him. I can trust him. I know that he can. I know that he can. So we're tempted. We're brought some things. Following through. Uh, go with me to, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, back to 2 Corinthians, and we'll uh, get to my last point here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12. Look what, look what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 12 here. Uh, verse number 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. He was given a special gift and special revelations from God no one else had. Notice what he says, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure, notice that, in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Then am I strong. Paul says, I've realized that when I'm in a weakened state like that, I get an opportunity to exalt the Lord and Savior. Paul was tempted, was tempted with an opportunity to not trust God. Now, it's easy for me to say that, having not gone through all that Paul went through. An opportunity to not trust God. That happens to us every day. Lord, I don't understand everything happening. I don't get it all, but I'm going to trust you. I'll trust you, no matter the cost, no matter what it is. And Paul says there was a messenger. Now, we're exa not exactly uh, sure or given detail in Scripture of what that was of a thorn in the flesh to him. What it was. It was a messenger of Satan, though. Messenger. That temptation came from the adversary. Came. And Paul said, I understand that God is in control, and I asked him about it. By the way, you can ask God about it. Ask him, Lord, why? Why? Why do I battle with these thoughts? Or why do I spout off when I shouldn't say that? Why, why do I do that? Why do I not do what I'm supposed to do? Why do I constantly fail in this regard? You can ask him. Help me, Lord. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee because my strength is made perfect in weakness. And God will exalt you and help you through the season that you may go through. Okay, now, these characters, and these are just a handful, many more through Scripture that we can find that when tempted, when tempted, did not give in. And one of the prime examples, you know, is Job. And when Job lost everything that he had, when Job lost all that he had, all that he had, we see that he exalted the Lord, didn't he? He says, not one time did he curse God. The wife said, curse God and die. Just give up and die. He was tempted to what? Not trust God. He was tempted to lean into his own understanding. A wonderful verse to study. Lean not into thine own understanding, but acknowledge him. And all thy paths, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And all thy ways, acknowledge him, excuse me, he shall direct thy paths. We lean. We lean. In order for you to lean, you have to lean onto something. You don't just stand here leaning unless you got one leg shorter than the other, I guess. <laughs> you lean on something, don't you? That's the whole idea behind the word. You lean. You lean upon something. You know. What are we leaning on? We're not leaning on Christ as we sing the song. Leaning upon his bosom as John did. We lean into what? Our own understanding. We all have walls we put up to lean upon. Well, of a crutch that we lean upon in some way. 
Can I encourage you to get rid of that? When the temptation comes your way, find the comfort, the comfort in him, the comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, chapter 10 and verse 5, if you're still there in 2 Corinthians. Notice what he says there. Chapter 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Well, things start in the mind, and that's where the adversary likes to get us. But he says to cast down those things. You ever have imaginations? I do. Imaginations about something that you shouldn't do. Imaginations about evil things. Imaginations about getting back at somebody. He says, cast them down. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God, that God is faithful, God is true, God does not allow something that you can't handle, God is in control of your life, God still knows what you can handle, what you can't handle. What is happening when we have these imaginations against the knowledge of God? They push against it. God is not faithful. With Job, what happened? God doesn't know what He's doing. God is not faithful. Why would He do this to you if He loved you? Do you remember His three friends? I mean, you've got to read 30-something chapters of these guys talking. <laughs> and you're going, when are they going to hush up? Well, God does know that if you would not have sinned, and there's sin in your life, Job, that you, what's that? against the knowledge of God. And Job responded time after time after time again that what? God is faithful. I trust God. I believe God. See what he says? And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are you doing? When that thought enters into your head, you take it and you put it under arrest. <laughs> what we talked about this morning, the bondage. You have control over your thoughts. A lot of people don't believe that. Well, these thoughts just pop into my mind out of nowhere. Yeah, but at that point, then you have control of what you're going to do with the thought. Get a hold of that thought, put it in handcuffs, and give it to Christ. No, I'm not going to think about that. Oh, yes, you are. No, I'm not. <laughs> Why? I'm bringing it into captivity. To the obedience of Christ and saying, Christ, Lord, I'm bringing this to you, and I'm going to obey you and follow you. Now, my friends, do you have knowledge of God? Do you have obedience to Christ? These are things that we're tempted with, to cast the things down that are exalting themselves against Christ and against who He is and against His Word and against all that He can do. What a wonderful thing. We see it today in many churches, and I'll close here. Many people lacking among many saints today a misunderstanding of what God is doing and how He will do it. It's easy to say at a time when you're not dealing with cancer and problems and pain and divorce and all kinds of issues, yeah, easy to say. We see that only the mature saints that withstand the battles and can withstand the battles that lie ahead if Jesus does not return in your lifetime. We stand the battles. We stand fast and true. As we said today, stand fast in the liberty. You stand fast. You stand firm. You stand strong. You stay what you're supposed to be doing. It's not easy to be in church. It's not easy. It's not easy to be a Christian. It's not easy to invite your family and friends. It's not easy. It's difficult. And the world looks at us and says, oh, they've got it so easy. No, we don't. We deal with the spiritual warfare that's around us. We put on the armor of God every day. And we understand that there's spiritual wickedness in high places. Can you imagine living in a world that is constantly against you? Yes, you can. <laughs> we do it every day. The world doesn't understand that. The world doesn't understand it. Can I encourage you with this just by way of closing? We need more soldiers for Christ. We need more men to stand and lead the home and say, I'm going to lead. I'm not going to do it my way anymore because it's not working. It's not working. We, we're constantly at odds. Something's not right. Okay, I've tried my way. Let's try, let's try God's way. Let's try God's way. This thing that I'm involved with, this addiction that I have that's wreaking havoc in our home, I'm going to give it to God and cast down those imaginations and bring into captivity those thoughts to Christ, and I'm going to spend time in the Word this week and time in prayer. What I'm doing is not working. We need more women of God that will stand up and say, you know what, okay, uh, I'll do my part in the home. I'll go ahead and do my part. I'll do what I'm supposed to do. What I'm commanded, find it in the Bible. Find the verses. Look it up. It's not very hard. I'll go ahead and do it. Although he won't do it, I'll do it. That's my responsibility. We need more children, young people. We need more pastors 
to stand. Oh, how we fail. How we fail. To stand for that. Why? So many are tossed to and fro, as the Bible says. Paul says, I came and wanted to give you meat, but I had to give you a little milk because you were still on the milk. You were still not weaned yet. You're still nursing. You haven't weaned yet. You're still an immature Christian. And when a little temptation comes into your life, you throw up a big old fit, big old fit over something so minor and ridiculous, right? I'm talking about myself here. Something so small, right? Something so ridiculous that will cause people to be dis- their, their lives destroyed, their homes wrecked. And on we go. Oh, we need Christians today that will stand for the truth. But my friends, do you know the Word? Do you know the God of the Word? The Bible says when we see Him, we'll know Him. There'll be no doubt. Who is that? Not one Christian is going to say, who is that? We'll all go, it's Him. Jesus came on walking on that shore. Do you remember? The guys threw down their stuff and said, we're going to go fishing. I'm tired of this ministry thing. It's not working. They killed the Lord. We don't know what to do. And they go out fishing, and Jesus comes walking on the shore. And they go, who is that? And what did John say? You know who that is. That's the Lord. That's the Lord. Oh, we'll know him. We'll know him. And, great picture there, we'll get him and meet him on that heavenly shore, and he'll have some nice fish ready for us. And we sit down and have some fellowship. Won't that be wonderful with the Lord? Just sweet fellowship with him, with him. And one day these temptations will be over. No more. I don't want to deal with that anymore. Do you ever get sick of it? I mean, just tired of that? The temptations and the problems and all, I'm sick of it. I mean, I'm so tired of them pushing the sexual perversion on us constantly, all the time. The lusting after things and the covetousness and all the things they push on. Oh, one day it'll be over, friends. But while we're here... I want to encourage you. You see the example after example throughout Scripture of men, of women that stood the test of time. They were tempted, they were tried, but they came through. One song we used to sing, when I am tried, I come forth as gold. That's what it does. Oh, that tempering agent. I want to encourage you to stay stay faithful, stand fast in the Lord, stand fast in the Lord, praising God for each one of you tonight for being so faithful to the house of God. Again, Stay focused. This week could be the week, could be your last week. By God's grace, it won't be, but it could be. And I want to be faithful. And I'm I'm glad we'll know we were in church on Sunday. Amen. (laughs) Uh, We were in church here. I did what I was supposed to do. Remember this. Where you are right now, 645-ish, you're where you're supposed to be. You're where you're supposed to be. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Don't forget that. You think, well, I'll, I'll be somewhere else. I'll, I'll maybe negate this responsibility. Do so. I, no, no, no. You're where you're supposed to be. Don't forget that. And when you're where you're supposed to be, God then can work and God can bless and God can move according to his perfect will. And now, for not only for us, but for others around us, especially children and friends and other people, you're where you're supposed to be tonight. Amen? All right, I'll stop there. Lord, thank you again for this opportunity. I say that often, but it truly is a privilege. I'm preaching things to these folks that are so faithful. Boy, it's hard to preach to people, Lord, that are godly people, that love you, that serve you every day, that lead their families, that love each other, that love you. And God, I pray that you'd help me. I pray something said tonight was a help. I pray something that we could use, we could put into our tool belt, if you will, and we can apply it. Help us this week. As all of us go our separate ways, Lord. Oh, how we need prayer. We are not exempt from failure. We're not exempt from problems. We're not exempt from tragedy. We're not exempt from disease and oh, so many things we could think about. I thank you so much for protecting our people, several of them that travel every single day on the highway back and forth, how you watch over them. I thank you for some of us that maybe don't travel that far, but keeping us safe. Be with those that are not here tonight, our loved ones and others that aren't feeling well. And I know and I believe so hard, so hard, have uh, wholeheartedly, excuse me, that they would want to be here. Thank you for them. But anyways, help us, Lord, tonight. Thank you for another opportunity to be in your house. As we know, we're where we're supposed to be. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And because of that, you can bless and work and use us according to your will. In Jesus' precious holy name, again we pray and amen.